Um, brothers and sisters, we are more than happy to be with you, to see you, to join you today. We have a very special guest, one that we've had for the last four sessions. I think this is our fourth session. In yes, fact, we've you. been doing uh, the re-scramble for Africa and why understanding why um, all the countries primarily European countries and China uh, uh, trying to get back in, in, into uh, Africa before, because of the resources, the abundant supply of resources uh, that are in Africa. And so we've had um, uh, quite a discussion of that for the last three sessions. But we wanted to veer off just a little bit. Um, Milton Adamati, who is our guest speaker and our lecturer, um, book was just released. Um, the book is, uh, is, is called The um, Manufacturing Hate, How Africa Was dehumanize uh, how Europeans uh, created an image that perpetuates Africa as a uh, as a country full of people that contributed very little or nothing to civilization. And um, they created this image of Africa and perpetuates it around the world. And Milton's book deals with how that is done and why it was done and how they continue to do that today and uh, the critical need for black people to break that cycle and change the image, first of all, uh, that they have of themselves and second of all, that the world has of Africa. Right. And so we're very pleased to bring you uh, Milton Adamati. Let me just introduce Milton primarily as a uh, professor of African studies at John Jay College. He is uh, he's an award-winning uh, uh, writer. He has. Uh, I, do you still write for the uh, New York uh, Times, Milton? No, oh, no. That was a long time ago when I was uh, a, a freelance reporter for the Metro Desk. No, 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 sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but he he won a couple of awards. Uh, uh, Milton is a graduate from uh, the School of Journalism at uh, New York University. Come he, on. He, he worked uh, with, um, oh boy, I skipped my, a uh, very good friend of mine uh, at, in the City Sun uh, years ago. He's passed now. And the Cooper. And the Cooper, that's him. Um and Milton also is the creator of uh, Black Star News. Um, he's, he's a lecturer, he's a writer. Um, uh, well, I could just go on and on. Milton, yes, sir. let's not waste any time. People have heard me too much. Can you get with it? Yes, sir. First of all, thank you again, Brother Clemson Brown. Thank you to all the listeners and viewers. Uh, just a slight correction. Uh, Columbia, a graduate school of journalism, not uh, NYU. Um, but, um, and thank you for the wonderful introduction that covered a lot of the objective of this book, Manufacturing Hate, How Africa Was Demonized in Western Media. This book actually, I think the idea, even though I didn't know it at the time, started when I was 12 years old. Um, as you know, I'm Ugandan born, but my family also lived in Tanzania. So I grew up partly in Tanzania, uh, where it's actually I went, I went to high school. Now, when I was 12, that's when I really started reading newspapers on a regular basis, because my father would send me out to buy him, my late father, a copy of the newspaper when it came out. 
uh, around 11 p.m. every night, I would make sure to read it before I uh, brought it home to him. So I got to know, to learn a lot about global issues, a lot about U.S. involvement in supporting the apartheid regime in South Africa, uh, the U.S. war on Vietnam. So he started developing a sense of political consciousness. And what I found most disturbing was how Africa, Africans, uh, African diaspora, black people generally all over the world were, uh, were portrayed in media. In the case of Africa, of course, it was uh, tribal communities. And whenever the West used the word tribe, it was never in a positive sense. It's not the way we mean. They mean totally something different. They mean these are backward, uncivilized people. <clears throat> so that's when I first got alerted to that uh, uh, misrepresentation. Uh, not really mis misrepresentation, but to them, because to them it was by design, you see? Uh, that that demonization is the better word, actually, of African people, whatever they were around the world. So then many years later, when I attended the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia, I had the opportunity to do a master's paper. So I selected as my topic to study uh, the evolution of how Africa and African diaspora uh, have been presented historically. So I went back all the way to the 17th century and I critiqued the writings of the so-called explorers, these uh, arrogant Europeans who went to Africa calling themselves explorers. <laughs> Africa did not invite anybody to explore Africa and they renamed these mountains, lakes and rivers and gave them European names, even though they had African names. And many of these European names still exist today. We still have Lake Victoria in East Africa, you know, uh, uh, in, in Uganda, Kenya, and Tanzania, this great body of water, as if there are no African heroes uh, whom we could name this lake after, and there are mountains and rivers and so forth. So I did that study, but then I also wanted to look at when journalists and writers started writing about Africa, how did they portray Africa? The so-called explorers were actually agents. They were scouts for imperialism. They wanted to map out where the valuable resources were um, in preparation for colonization, the official colonization of Africa, which happened the last 20 years of the 19th century, ending with the Berlin Conference of November 1884 to February 1885, when Africa was formally and officially partitioned. The so-called explorers had done the groundwork, mapping out the resources and the valuable um, uh, resources uh, available throughout the continent. So that was their primary work. Now, the newspapers and the writers and journalists who were sent from the West continued that same mission that the so-called explorers had started. And the language that they used in the early coverage and writing about Africa was very identical to the groundwork and the template that had been created by these so-called explorers. And that is what my, my, my work uh, research and analyze. And before I switch into the book and I can introduce, I think the best way is to read the the title of the chapters of the book, the 17 chapters, that will give the listener and viewer a clear indication of what this book is about. But before I get to that, I would like to tell you one challenge, uh, one experience I faced when I was still a student at Columbia that made me realize that it was going to be a challenge to tell this story. <laughs> so let me tell you that story. When I was still a student at Columbia and I finished the master's paper, the master's paper won one of the awards. There are about five or six awards given uh, to every graduating class at Columbia. So my paper won one of those awards. And then I was invited by a magazine called Columbia Journalism Review to submit my paper to them so they could publish it in the magazine. So I gave it to them. And then I waited one month 
uh, pass with one issue of the magazine and my paper was not in it. My story was not there. The second month passed and I didn't see my article. And now I'm about to graduate and obviously I wanted it to be published while I was still a student with my peers, correct? So then I decided to call the editor of the magazine. His name is uh, Michael Hoyt. And I said, what's happening with my, my paper? I'm about to graduate. When is it going to be published? And he said, oh, there's been a change of plans. It's not going to be published. <laughs> I said, well, first of all, when were you going to tell me this? And obviously he did not have an answer to that. And then I said, I asked him a, a question. I said, what happened? He said, well, uh, two editors voted to support publishing, two editors voted to oppose publishing, and the top editor, the executive editor, who is actually his boss, voted against publishing. As I said, and what was the reason for them opposing publication? He said, well, there was a thought that these things happened a long time ago. <laughs> I said, okay, so how are you going to study history and write about history without going back a long time ago? So he had no answer for that. Then he said something which really uh, uh, shocked me at that time because I was still a little bit naive, I guess. I said, uh, I would like to have my paper back. And he said, why would you want it back? I was shocked by that kind of question. How would somebody ask me why I wanted my own paper back? <laughs> I said, what do you mean? This is my paper. So I want it back. And then he said something which really lit a light in my head. He said, it is not the same as what you gave us. It's been edited. I said, that's precisely why I want it back. So now I'm very curious as what, what, what is this? What's going on? You know, why would somebody ask you why you want your own paper back? So I went straight to his office because at that time, uh, the Columbia Journalism Review, their office is on the top floor of the journalism school. And perhaps he did not realize I was calling him from downstairs. So I went straight up to his office and I kid you not, I walked into his office. He was standing behind a pile of papers and, and then he saw me and he was shocked. He was generally shocked. He didn't expect me to come walk into his office. I said, I'm here for my paper. I didn't even bother saying what was going on. I said, I'm here for my paper. So now he starts going into every different location, right? Opening drawers like he's looking for my paper. And then he came back to the same spot where I found him standing, where his hand had been, you know, shuffling something. And he pulled my paper out from beneath a pile. <laughs> you know, so obviously he knew where the paper was, even though he pretended to be searching. He gave it to me. And I, I, I walked out and I started reading it before I reached the elevator. They were afraid of the New York Times and how the New York Times would react. And that is why they did not publish the paper. And the evidence was in their own edited version. And if, if we go into the book, I might find that precise language. But let me just paraphrase it. Essentially, what they said is that this paper is not a criticism of the New York Times. Because after all, the New York Times has done exceptional reporting about Africa. This paper is just to show how every media can go a little bit astray, you know? <laughs> so they wrote this on my behalf without telling me, meaning they were considering to publish it and they had been debating, how do we massage this and get it out? At the end of the day, they still decided not to publish the paper, you see? So yes. I said, I will not give them the benefit. I won't stop. I, can, I continue the research. At one point I had a, a self-published uh, uh, book called uh, Hearts of Darkness, how white writers uh, created the racist image of Africa. But the challenge is when you self-publish, it's difficult to get into colleges. It's, different to, it's difficult to get a wide distribution. Uh, it's difficult to get reviewed, almost impossible. So all these years I've been working on it, expanding it, developing it, updating it to include new contemporary issues. And that is how I ended up with manufacturing hate how Africa was demonized in Western media. And I finally have uh, secured a publisher, Kendall Hunt Publishing Company, 
and 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 it just came out on June the 14th, I believe was the official launch date uh, for this book, which I'm holding uh, in my hand. And now, uh, unless you had a few questions, I can go into reading the headline of the chapters and I can read a little bit from the book itself so uh, viewers can get a sampling. But I want to pause to see if you had any questions at this stage. Well, uh, 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 a viewer just uh, typed me a question. Don't forget Europeans put forth the narrative that Africans sold their own people into slavery. Uh, yeah. Things like this make Europeans feel less guilty, but I know you're gonna cover all this, but I just wanted him to know that no, absolutely. we no, in, fact, in fact, we dealt with that in one of our earlier episodes, as you recall. Yes. That's a very convenient way of Europeans to wash their hands of the crimes. But listen to this. Let me give you this. And I hope people think deeply about this. There were Jews who operated some of the gas chambers. There were Jews who were involved in exterminating other Jews. Does that exonerate Hitler for the crimes that were committed against the Jews? Does that exonerate the Nazi extermination of the Jews? Nobody ever puts it that way. So why do they focus on some corrupted Africans that may have been involved in the crimes against fellow Africans? Think about it that way. They never bring that up. They focus yeah. on the crime committed against the Jewish people. And that yeah. is a crime that nobody denies. So why are we trying to deny the crimes committed against Africans and we find some scapegoats in a way to exonerate these crimes? We should not mm -hmm. accept it. We should always use that as the analogy and challenge them. Nobody ever says that. <laughs> yes. I think, I think that answers that question. Yes. Okay, now, uh, Milton, continue. Ahead, Please read the chapters and, 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 and we can move forward. Okay, great. So let me read you the headlines of the chapters. <clears throat> I will just quickly go through from chapter 1 to 17. Chapter 1, inquiry into the origins of black skin. Chapter 2, Europeans travel to Africa to discover Africa. Chapter three, a European traveler meets a quote, savage, unquote, intellectual. Chapter four, the Africans alleged docility. Chapter five, National Geographic Magazine's African concoctions. Chapter six, the Mahdists defeat General Gordon. Chapter seven, Empress Taitu and Emperor Menelik II destroy Italian invaders. Chapter eight, Mussolini's war crimes against the Ethiopians. Chapter nine, the New York Times as early apologist for apartheid. Chapter 10, Kenya's quote, Mau Mau, end quote, devils. Chapter 11, barbarian cult feared in Nigeria. Chapter 12, the alleged need to recolonize Africa. Chapter 13, Rwanda, noble Africans versus true Negroes. Chapter 14, Africa and black inferiority complex. Chapter 15, Africans are not, quote, tribesmen, unquote. Chapter 16, Uga Booga Journalism. Chapter 18, Critiquing Africa Without the Racism. So these are the headlines, the titles of the chapters, and I think it gives you a sense of what each of these chapters are about. I mean, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go into each of the individual chapters, but what I've decided to do is to read some samplings from a couple of the chapters, and then maybe we can get into a discussion. Okay. And at any point, if you want to, me to pause to pose a question, don't hesitate. So let me do reading number one. This is from the introduction. In the introduction, this is now updated with what happened in Libya, the Libyan war. To what extent did corporate media enable the NATO war of aggression 
that destroyed Libya. Throughout the conflict, the New York Times referred to the anti-Qaddafi insurgents in glowing terms as, quote, revolutionaries, end quote, even though the insurgents themselves were posting evidence of their barbaric atrocities, beheadings against black Libyans on YouTube. Presumably, the Times editorial board hoped that once they seized power, the insurgents would transform themselves overnight into Democrats. The NATO-backed insurgents eventually deposed Gaddafi. They lived up to their reputation of brutality. Gaddafi was captured and sodomized with a bayonet and eventually killed. Many of his captured fighters were summarily executed. A black fighter was infamously tied like a trophy on the mounted gun of a military jeep, which was triumphantly driven around. Gaddafi's body was publicly displayed in an open refrigerated room. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, when told of Gaddafi's death, laughingly told a television interviewer, quote, we came, we saw, he died, end quote. Clinton then hurriedly flew to Libya and posed for photographs with the insurgents, now the new power. Presumably, she believed the photograph would be valuable in the future once she launched her 2016 presidential run. Perhaps she planned to use the picture to remind voters of her role in creating the new Libya. Clinton's celebration was premature. By 2014, the NATO war on Libya had turned out to have been a colossal disaster. The country was reduced to totally unknocking conditions, a non-state and a haven for several terrorist groups, including ISIS. So this is the first reading. I don't know if you want me to pause for questions or go on to the second reading. Go on to the second reading and maybe we can get a third or fourth reading in. <laughs> okay. Okay, let me go to the second reading. This is one of the so-called explorers who went to Africa. His name was Samuel Baker. In 1866, he wrote a book called, uh, uh, called Albert Nyanza. So now let me read from the book that I wrote. <clears throat> In 1866, the egomaniacal traveler, Samuel Baker, a rabid racist who called himself, quote, Baker of the Nile, end quote, a reference to his purported contribution toward finding the source of the River Nile, published Albert Nyanza, Great Basin of the Nile. Many Africans reared under the colonial system and even in the post-colonial era which is still heavily British influenced, were taught to revere Baker as a great explorer and even a hero. Some of these Africans were unfamiliar with the content of Baker's book and his deep-seated prejudice. Others had developed inferiority complex and saw no need to reject Baker's blatant racism. Quote, I wish the black sympathizers in England could see Africa's innermost art as I do, much of their sympathy would subside, end quote. Baker wrote in one passage, <clears throat> quote, human nature viewed in its crude state as pictured amongst African savages is quite on a level with that of the brute and not to be compared with the noble character of the dog. There's neither gratitude, pity, love, nor self-denial, no idea of duty, no religion, but covetousness, ingratitude, selfishness, cruelty. All of them are thieves, idle, envious, ready to plunder and enslave their weaker neighbors. So long as it is generally considered that the Negro and the white man are to be governed by the same laws, and guided by the same management, so long will the former remain a thorn in the side of every community to which he may unhappily belong. When the horse and the ass shall be found to match in double harness, the white man and the African black will pull together under the same regime. 
end quote. So let me now find reading number three. All right, so this is the New York Times apologizing on behalf of Imperial England when England had attacked the Zulus and the Zulus had defeated England in one of the battles at Isandruana. Now that victory was never recovered <laughs> prominently in the New York Times. But when England brought in more reinforcements, many more troops, and then they won another battle, that is the one that the New York Times celebrated. And let me read partly now from the book. On January 22, 1879, a Zulu army commanded by Nshingwayo Kamahole Koza defeated an invading British army under Lieutenant General Lord Kelmsford at the Battle of Isandruana in South Africa. The Zulus killed 1,600 enemy soldiers. It was the worst defeat a British army had ever suffered in Africa. The British regrouped and ultimately sent a better equipped and well-reinforced army against the Zulu. It was after a subsequent battle when the British prevailed that the New York Times published an article claiming that it was futile for African armies to challenge Europeans on the battlefield. Quote, whether or not Providence is on the side of the heaviest battalions, there can be little doubt of the result of a contest between a civilized nation with great military and naval power and inexhaustible resources, the Times declared in an article on July 25, 1879, quote, and a primitive and barbarous tribe, however brave and unyielding, End quote. The Times seemed offended by the Zulus' temerity that they had dared to defend themselves against an initially defeated British invaders who wanted to seize their land. Quote, sooner or later, the powerful nation was destined to bring the savage tribe into abject submission or demolish it utterly, the New York Times warned. The justice of the cause had nothing to do with this foregone conclusion, end quote. All right, so these are uh, three initial samples from the early era of African coverage. And I don't know if you want me to pause or continue reading other excerpts. Uh, I just want to throw in that uh, we're celebrating uh, as of yesterday, Juneteenth. Yes. Which is the... Um, which is the uh, Emancipation Day that happened in Texas some two or three years after emancipation had been signed. Correct. But African people, the most important thing, uh, and I'm asking you to comment on this, is that they must, in order to be free, they must know this history. Yes. This history not only changes one's mind, but it changes one's ability. And the yes. world will perceive you and treat us as they see us. So as long as they have an image of us that we never really contributed anything to development of civilization, right? Uh, created things like mathematics and science and medicine and even language itself, Absolutely. All of these things the Africans brought into being while Europeans were still in caves. So this war which is going on that the Europeans are, are trying to perpetuate, continue to uh, perpetuate an image of African people uh, which they created and is a total lie is a war against good and evil life and destruction and so forth. How, how do you spiritually uh, 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 explain this war? What is really going on? Because you can't have the truth and, and a lie 
both existing in the same space. Well, so, well, you, the, the only way you can have that is when the controller of the narrative is the only person that tells the story. And that is where we come in to expose this um, distorted, corrupted narrative, which is a narrative meant to justify the enslavement of Africans, to justify the colonization of Africa, and to justify what we have in the 21st century, uh, colonialism under a new name, which is now neo-colonialism. And I don't want to add anything to what you just said in terms of the summary. You captured it absolutely. If you do not know your story, you will accept anything. And one of the best students of this was actually our brother Malcolm X, who once he elevated his consciousness became one of the best teachers. And I have actually an excerpt that I also wish to read uh, from the book when Malcolm is talking about how the Europeans through this demonization made us, and he's talking about himself now, hate our own ancestors, made us hate Africa. And he said it very simple terms that people can understand. He said, you cannot hate the roots of a tree without hating the tree. You cannot hate Africa without hating yourself. And that is the whole purpose about this, to castrate us as African people intellectually, not only in diaspora, but in Africa itself, even today. So a lot of the history that we need to know is not even taught today on our motherland in Africa. I, I have people, and this is the saddest part, people from the continent contacting me here, sitting in New York, to thank me for the knowledge that I'm teaching them from here in New York. When you have Africans, so-called running African countries in the 21st century and not being able to teach the kind of history that would liberate African people because of course, they don't want a liberated Africa as well. Most of the so-called leaders we have in Africa work on behalf of imperialism. You see, they're the elite. They're not starving. They don't endure any hardship. So they're comfortable. They know that once you educate Africans, you'll have the kind of people that Thomas Sankara wanted in Burkina Faso. Thomas Sankara wanted educated Africans. He didn't care at what cost to himself. He knew he was going to be killed. When he attended the OAU meeting in 1987, in July, he said, let's renounce the debt, but let's do it together. If we don't do it together, I won't be alive to be here for the next year's meeting. So he knew the challenge he faced, but he was willing to face the challenge. He predicted his death. Three months later, he was dead. But today, what Sankara taught is still reverberating, not only in Africa, but around the world. Burkina Faso ultimately threw out uh, Blaise uh, Kampaure, who had killed Sankara. Why? Because Sankara taught them the right lesson. So if you teach our people the right lesson, they will take action in their own hands and liberate themselves. Yes. May I may I ask a question as well? Yes, my brother. So, uh, and understand you, we're talking about the narrative, um, or, you know, that has been portrayed about Africa, and that, and how that has been used as a major tool for our colonization um, yes. and continued oppression. Um, and so, my question is, you know, especially for young students um, who you know want to go to university here in the United States or high, seek higher learning in general, how does you know knowledge production? Um, you know, that is, you know, because yeah, like you're saying, they're not teaching us these histories in right. at these institutions. And right. so how can we produce knowledge and share history that is for our liberation and is for the continue, like the reclamation of our of the narrative while attending these institutions at the same time? So what is the you know, how how is it possible to be able to do, you know, to be able to reclaim our narrative in institutions that, you know, are, you know, do not want to do that? Okay, well, I, I appreciate your question. 
And that is exactly what we need to do. And thank you for this digital era and social media and platforms such as uh, uh, YouTube. Uh, before, we could not be having this conversation that we're having right now. So we need to package this information and whether it entails having this kind of discussion we're having at the moment or repackaging it into even shorter clips that are disseminated widely. These are the things that we need to do because young people obviously appreciate the knowledge. When I announced the publication of my book I, uh, last week, I could just tell by the reaction on my Facebook page with more than 400 people responding immediately that that yearning for the information is out there, you know? So I think your question, your question strikes to the issue that we're dealing with right now. And, and that is why having this kind of conversation, this platform that Brother Clemson Brown has is extremely valuable. We just need to multiply it and have many such platforms. But young people also, I know, appreciate information when it's repackaged into shorter forms. And that's when the repackaging of the shorter clips comes into play as well. And the good thing about young people is they know how to produce this content, or at least to repackage it. And that's why I think uh, we have a good chance of getting this information widely disseminated. Milton? Yes. Uh, would you move to the next chapter and read from it? Sure, okay, great. So let me go to uh, item number four. All right, so this is the prelude to the Battle of Adwa when Ethiopia defeated invading Italian Imperial Army and killed about 3,000 of the soldiers in the Italian military. They captured 3,000 and march them back to Addis, the capital, and put them to work. So here now you have Africans supervising Europeans who got a taste of how it felt uh, to be enslaved. Uh, some of the dead they killed included two generals. They captured one general, marched him back to Addis as well, and they made Italy pay millions and millions uh, of dollars before they released the Italian soldiers after they'd made them work for, for many months. But before that, the Italians had scored some victories along the way a couple of years earlier. So when the Italians won in, in 1990, 1890, I'm sorry, six years before the 1896 Battle of Adwa, here is how the New York Times covered that occasion. The Italians, under Prime Minister Francesco Crispi, were emboldened by earlier victories in the region, as documented in the New York Times. In 1890, Crispi had sent an invasion force that conquered Eritrea and other territories that were also claimed by Ethiopia. On that occasion, the New York Times published a triumphalist account of this war of aggression. Quote, the Italians in Africa, results of Crispi's brilliant policy, the Times proclaimed in the headline of a February 2nd, 1890 article, lauding the invasion. Quote, declaration of a protectorate over King Menelik's domain, Europe's astonishment, end quote. The headline concluded using a different spelling of the emperor's name. The article was a melodramatic celebration of European imperial assault on Africa, Italy, according to the Times article, quote, had achieved triumph upon triumph in Africa, end quote. And there had been a surrender by, quote, all the tribes, end quote. The Italians had defeated Ras Alula Engida, a renowned general who was referred to by European writers as the Garibaldi of Abyssinia, a reference to Giuseppe Garibaldi, the famed general and politician who fought in the many wars leading to the unification of Italy in 1871. The Times February 2, 1890 article claimed the quote, natives welcomed the Italians as liberators. Quote, Europe now marvels and perhaps scarcely credits its own eyes 
Italy in Adwa, the Times proclaimed. Is it true or is it a dream? Nothing in the world has the power to drive the Italian troops from their central position. Okay, so that's 1890. Now let me switch to how they reported 1896 when the shoes, when the tables were turned. The celebration was premature. When Italy finally moved to conquer all of Ethiopia in 1896, Menelik II was prepared. He had mobilized a sizable army and had imported arms, including artillery from Russia. The dispute over the Treaty of Wachale was finally resolved on the battlefield. The fighting started at 6 a.m. on March 1, 1896, and by noon, it was all over for the Italians. This time around, the good newspaper, the New York Times, offered a mournful tone. Quote, Italy's terrible defeat, end quote, the Times proclaimed in the headline of a March 6, March 4, 1896 article about the Battle of Adwa. Of course, there was nothing terrible about this decisive confrontation for the Ethiopians. It was catastrophic disaster for imperialism. Menelik and his wife, Empress Tetu Betul, led their forces into combat. The Empress herself commanded an army of 6,000 men. Menelik's combined, combined armed forces comprised an alliance of princes who were often at war with each, each other. The Italian invasion brought them together against a common foe. European invaders. One of Menelik's commanders, Ras Mikael, reputedly yelled, a balgume, a balgume, or reap, reap, as he plunged with his soldiers into the Italian lines. Ras Alula Engida, one of Menelik's leading commanders, now avenged his early defeat at the hands of the Italians. The overall losses inflicted in an original army of 17,000 were staggering. 2,918 Italian non-commissioned officers and men were killed. Two African soldiers from Eritrea or Ascaris fighting for Italy were killed. 261 Italian soldiers were permanently missing and 56 cannons and 11,000 rifles were captured. The dead included two Italian generals, Giuseppe, Arimonde and Vittorio da Bormida. Major General Matteo Albatone was captured. Many of Menelik's generals wanted the Ethiopian army to pursue the panic stricken Italians and wipe out survivors as they fled toward Eritrea. Menelik knew the cost of provisioning his large army if the conflict became protracted. He rejected the recommendation. Italians could not recommend what had happened in Africa and the national establishment refused to accept the defeat. Instead, the campaign's commander in chief, General Oreste Baratieri was blamed for quote, poor military strategy, end quote, by the Italian government and newspapers. Every possible ex excuse was entertained. The Italians refused to credit the Ethiopians with military genius. The Ethiopians suffered heavy losses too but it was their country and they were willing to make sacrifices to defend it. The New York Times reported that reinforcement from Italy were to be quickly sent to Africa. Political conditions were so grave that Pope Leo XIII canceled a major diplomatic banquet celebrating the anniversary of his coronation. The Italian government was destabilized by the defeat, the Times reported, and its survival was in jeopardy. And ultimately, the Italian government was actually overthrown back in Italy as a result of the loss they suffered in Ethiopia. I don't want, I don't know if you want me to read a few more. Yes, I do. Okay. So let me go to. Uh, let me ask Cosmos, do you have a question before we continue, Cosmos? Uh, yes, sir. I'll, I'll, I definitely do have another question. Um, yes. And and it's definitely, it definitely pertains to the the language um, around this conversation because, you know, and uh, you know, we're speaking of war, like you're saying, there, there was there were wars that happened that you know, that 
was to take our resources to oppress us. And, you know, when it comes to now the, you know, this re scramble for Africa, and when we're talking about that conversation, um, you know, trying to not use, um, what is what is the word I'm trying to find, but trying to make it a euphemistic terms for what is happening. Right. Um, and so I, I was kind of wondering what, what your perspective is on that, you know, especially as people who are going to be, you know, sharing this information widely and talking about it. What is the language that you feel should be used around it, whether it should be euphemistic or whether it should be direct and that Very good. a war against our people and we need okay. to act accordingly? Very good. You you ask a very clever question. Here's how, how I would respond to that. Knowing our people, we need to condition them and educate them first into accepting plain language. Often when you tell our people the plain truth, because as Malcolm said, actually, that Malcolm was very good at analyzing. He said, once they demonize you as an extremist, it means anything and everything you say is considered to be extreme. <laughs> you see, people don't even pay attention to what you're saying anymore. They don't rationalize and say, you know, this person is actually speaking truth uh, to power. You see, so that is why this back history is critical. I have no doubt that once our people access this back history, then they will be ready to entertain the plain truth. There are some who are ready because they've been educating themselves beyond the knowledge that is provided in the establishment uh, uh, academia. You see, so those are ready. But to go back to your question, the vast majority, unfortunately, are not ready. They need to be conditioned. Um, another good book is Steve Biko. I write what I like. And Steve Biko analyzed that as well. He said, because our people had been so conditioned to have inferiority complex and to internalize their suffering, they started seeing themselves as, as the cause of their condition. You see, because that is obviously what the European narrative wants to be accepted, that Africans were, were enslaved or were colonized because they deserve to be enslaved or deserve to be colonized. So now the criminal is turning the burden of the crime <laughs> on the victims. And that has consequences and effect. And in fact, I'm going to read precisely what Malcolm said about that, but the conditioning is, is, is important. So what I try to do is I try to be as plain as possible without scaring off uh, many of our people. I don't know if that answers the question. Absolutely, and uh, yeah, definitely. I'll do more research in regards to you know Steve Biko and his communication, but I think that is, another, that is, that is one of my personal struggles Yes. Uh, it definitely does alienate um, a lot of people when you do speak truth to power in a way yes. that is unwavering. And so yes. you know, I'm trying to now understand how do I communicate yes. you know, what is really happening in a way that is, um, you know, a little bit more palatable, I would say. Right. That's why sometimes it's good to refer them to other work that have already been published. Mm -hmm. And once they engage that and they encounter that, then they, you know, they become more accepting. So, you know, right now, Unfortunately, the information that they have is holding them back, which is one of the most successful things that the colonials have been able to uh, do to make us really uh, uh, colonize, to colonize our minds, and then to make us fail uh, to liberate our minds. Another good book I recommend is Decolonizing the Mind by Ngugi Wationgo. And both of these books are available also on uh, um, on all the uh, the platforms that sell books. Absolutely. I, I appreciate you taking the time to answer that question. Absolutely. Questions are what keeps the conversation uh, uh, moving, you know? All right, so now, let me go to uh, at an era now when the New York Times and other Western publications started sending reporters to Africa to write from Africa.
All right. Uh, let me start from this part. All right, it's going to be a little longer because if I start midway, then it won't capture uh, the essence. All right, so let me start. The consolidation of the apartheid regime by the white minority and the colonization of the rest of Africa amidst the Cold War were two of the biggest stories on the continent that coincided with the long reign of Emmanuel Friedman on the foreign news desk. However, the Times foreign editor never took Africans seriously. Friedman preferred stories that depicted Africans as people who were frozen in an earlier century. Modern man could read all about these Africans in the New York Times. The Times reporter who became Friedman's reliable ally in demonizing Africans during the 1960s was Homer Bigart. He was precisely the Bilbo of that, that White had warned the Times against sending to Africa in his 1952 memo to Friedman and Catledge. By 1959, when Friedman sent Bigart to Africa on a temporary assignment to cover the end of European colonial rule, the reporter was already renowned in American journalism with 20 years of experience. He had been a war correspondent and had won the Pulitzer Prize twice while he was a reporter with the New York Herald Tribune. Bigard joined the Times in 1955 and worked there until 1972. Some of the countries Bigard visited during his African assignment were Ghana, Nigeria, Rwanda, Urundi, the former Belgian colony are today the two separate countries of Rwanda and Burundi and the Belgian Congo, which is today the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Bigard was contemptuous of his African assignment. Quote, I'm afraid I cannot work up any enthusiasm for the emerging republics, end quote. He wrote in an undated letter to Friedman from Africa, quote, the politicians are either crooks or mystics. Dr. Nkrumah is a Henry Wallace in burnt cork. I vastly prefer the primitive Bush people. After all, cannibalism may be the logical antidote to this population explosion everyone talks about." End quote. Bigot's favorite terms for describing the Africans he wrote about were, quote, barbaric, macabre, grotesque, and, quote, savage. The content for Africa that he wrote, the contempt for Africa that he wrote openly about to Friedman was also conveyed in what were published in the Times purporting to be news articles. Typical of the prose that Bigard and Friedman favored was an article about a reported incident of communal violence published on January 31, 1960 in the Times under the headline, quote, Barbarian Cult Feared in Nigeria. End quote. Bigard wrote in his lead sentence that, quote, a pocket of barbarism still exists in eastern Nigeria, despite some success by the regional government in extending a crust of civilization over the tribe of the pagan Isi. End quote. He added, quote, a momentary lapse into cannibalism marked the closing days of 1959 when two men killed in a tribal clash were partly consumed by enemies in the Cross River country below Obubra. Garroting was the society's favorite method of execution. None of the victims was eaten, at least not by society members. Less lurid but equally effective ways were found to dispose of them. According to the police, about 26 were weighed with stones and timber and thrown into flooded rivers. No trace has been found of these bodies. A few were buried in ant heaps, but most became human fertilizer for the yam crops." End quote. Friedman in New York was evidently delighted with this type of, quote, journalism, end quote, by Bigart from Africa. Quote, this is just a note to say hello and to tell you how much your peerless prose from the Badlands is continuing to give us and your public, end quote. 
Friedman wrote to Big Art in a later dated March 4, 1960. Quote, by now, you must be American journalism's leading expert on sorcery, witchcraft, cannibalism, and all the other exotic phenomena indigenous to darkest Africa. All this and nationalism too? Where else but in the New York Times can you get all this for a nickel, end quote. So this is one account, an example of the demonization. Big Art then went on to Belgian Congo to cover the independence there. And he wrote a letter to his editor, Friedman, complaining that he could not find any pygmies to interview about what independence meant for them. But when the article was published in the New York Times, they have him now quoting pygmies and saying to pygmies, independence means they can have more beer, they can have more salt, even though he had written a letter confirming that he could not find any to interview. So they just concocted this scenario and inserted it into the article that he wrote. And there's another example. And as I said, unfortunately, I won't have time to read all the parts that are actually good. But there's another example where a reporter named Lloyd Garrison wrote a letter to his New York editor here complaining, saying, who put that in my article? And what did they put in his article without his knowledge? They put a scene in Nigeria of people dressed in grass leaves, grass leaf skirts, like those images you see from Tarzan that the reporter never saw, never wrote, but editors sitting here in New York said, nah, this article is not, <laughs> is not tribal enough. So they inserted that in his news article. So they talk about fiction. It was a complete, complete fictitious scene that they inserted in something published in the newspaper and called it a real news story from Africa. Milton, if I may, because we are coming to the end of our hour, uh, but many people ask me about China and what do I feel is the benefits and the negative impact that China is having on Africa? In fact, I've been um, reading some pieces where uh, China, uh, even though they've done some things that are very beneficial, they are uh, just like any other uh, invading country that is looking out for itself and wants the resources of Africa and would have no uh, problems uh, in later years or even now in their setting up um, to take Africa in, in a situation where they're in control and Africans just, you know, provide the raw resources um, and the minerals and et cetera. But do you, how do you see them? What's the impact of China on Africa? And, and, and that will be our final question. I see, I see China a very similar way in the way you see it as well. Um, China, yes, has not had the same imperial history like Europe did in terms of invading Africa, you know, killing millions of Africans, colonizing Africa, setting up a European administration in Africa. So they've never done that. They've never invaded, conquered, killed Africans or set up Chinese administration in Africa. But China is what I would see like those check cashing places that you see in our communities, you know? They become very convenient and very necessary because we don't have regular banks. We don't have investment to serve our communities, our African communities here in New York and in urban areas across the United States. So that's the kind of analogy in which I see China, convenient source of banking, convenient source of capital. But at the end of the day, China is not going to help Africa industrialize. You see, that is something that only Africans can do for themselves, you see? So in that respect, China, of course, is not as atrocious as in, in its imperialism as European imperialism. But the fact that China uses its, uh, finance, its capital to extract resources from Africa, yes, uh, they'll build railways, yes, they'll build bridges, they'll build roads, they've constructed buildings, they built the headquarters of the African Union. But nonetheless, 
in order for Africa to become like China is today, is for Africa to use its resources to build factories and industries in Africa and build Africa, not sell raw materials to the rest of the world and then have them manufacture it into something that they sell back to you at prices that are like 100 times more than the resources that they need. <laughs> they couldn't build those things without our resources. So how is it that we get so little for the resources they need and that we pay so much for the manufactured products? That equation needs to change. Only Africans can change it. We need to unify and have a United States of Africa. That's how we'll have enough power to protect our resources. We'll have enough economies of scale to build our factories. China did it in 60 years. In 1960, the per capita income of China was $80. The per capita income of Ghana was 194. That's not a very long time ago, 1960. Today, the per capita income of Ghana is $2,200. China is more than $11,000. So China is now five times higher per capita income than Ghana, when in 1960, Ghana was more than double <laughs> of China. How did China do it? China killed out, I mean, kicked out all the imperialists, the Europeans, the, the opium war and all the uh, disruption that had been causing in China. China took control of its politics, its sovereignty, its resources, and its people after the Chinese revolution. And that's why today China is a superpower. If Africans had followed the examples of uh, what Kwame Nkrumah uh, wrote about in neocolonialism, the last stage of imperialism, Africa today would be just as powerful as China is today. We want to uh, thank you, Milton. Um, Brother Cosmos, if, if you have a last question, we'll entertain it. Yes, please. I was going to request, I'll say, I just have one last question. Um, and it, it does fit in with what um, Alimari was saying. Uh, so my question is about uh, Malcolm's speech in Cairo at the o OAU summit um, and how, you know, how it pertains to the rescramble of Africa currently um, and what he was, you know, what he was talking about then uh, as it regards to the United States and black people here um, in America and also the relationship with, um, you know, uh, those of us in, um, in Africa. And I was wondering, you know, if you could maybe talk a little bit of that or maybe put it in context. Yes, I will. I appreciate that question. Malcolm is one of my big heroes of today. I have uh, many excerpts that I have in the book. Unfortunately, we don't have time for me to read what Malcolm said. Uh, but in fact, I'm going to be working on a book as well, Malcolm in Africa, that should be ready for next year. Malcolm saw through the Western deception and he realized that if we combined the resources of Africa with the intellectual capital and the financial capital of sisters and brothers in the United States, that would be it. That would be the end of imperialism in Africa. And Africa would emerge as a power. And I've been reading many of his uh, notes from his diary, many of his letters that are available at the Schomburg. Hopefully once the Schomburg reopens, people should go there and read Rather than reading what people say about what Malcolm said, read his own words, read his writings. They're available, very valuable. And I've assembled enough for me to work on a book that ties uh, Malcolm uh, very strongly to Africa. Uh, he made that speech, and this is the key point that he made there. He says, so long as Africans in diaspora, AKA African-Americans, are fighting against the racism in this country, by going to the perpetrator of the crime, it will never be resolved. He said, we need to take it to the United Nations. This is not a civil rights issue. This is a human rights issue. And in order for us to be able to take it to the UN, we need African leaders because they are members of the United Nations. So they can raise this issue, have a debate at the UN. And once the whole world is looking at the crimes being committed by the United States against African-Americans, then we can arrive at a so solution. And that was the most valuable impact. And I think that is the real reason why Malcolm was eliminated. It was becoming too dangerous when he had this pan-African global vision and saw the power in uniting Africa with sisters and brothers in this country. And he had access. He met Gamel Abdel Nasser, 
the leader of Egypt. He met Milton Obote of Uganda. He met Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya. He met Julius Nyerere of Tanz Tanganyika at that time, now Tanzania. He met Abdurrahman Babu, who's one of the ministers in Tanzania. He met Tom Boya, who was a minister in Kenya. He met Oginga Odinga, who was a minister. He met uh, uh, Namdi Azikiwe, uh, president of, uh, of Nigeria. He met all these leaders. He met Sekuture, uh, the, the leader of, uh, of Guinea. So Malcolm had become very dangerous to imperialism. And no matter who pulled the trigger, I don't believe the people that actually pulled the trigger were the true masterminds of why Malcolm was killed. But I, I got to ask you a question because we're talking about Malcolm. But Dr. King was also a Pan-Africanist in, in, in many ways. Yes. And, and he was more conscious of our need to be one with Africa and people uh, think or even know, most people don't even know that Dr. King was very interested in the unity of African-Americans and Africans. Could you close with that? Yes, I will close with that by saying, go to YouTube and put Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the birth of a new nation. Because rather than me even saying it, you will listen to his remarkable speech after he had come back from Ghana. He was 27 year old, years old. Kwame Nkrumah was able to see that this is a dynamic young man who's going to go places and invited him to attend Ghana's independence celebration in March, 1957. Dr. King came back and to his church, he made this remarkable, brilliant speech. Not enough people know about this speech. That is the part of Dr. King. That is not widely taught by the establishment because <laughs> they don't want to make this connection between Africa and sisters and brothers in this continent. So that would be my response. Please go listen to that speech. In fact, now that you reminded me, I'm going to go listen to it again later today. The birth Thank of a new nation. Thank you, uh, Milton. It's, uh, it's, it's just a pleasure to my have pleasure. you on the program again. I'm going to ask everybody if they would uh, go... Uh, and uh, subscribe, ring the bell, help us spread this information around. Look, send us out, uh, send links out to everybody you know. Have them join us. Um, we got about 500 uh, tapes on African history. Everybody you know, Dr. Ben, Dr. Clark, Dr. Aza Hillard, Ivan Van Sertima. I mean, all, you know, we done traveled everywhere. Come and get this information. It's just waiting to educate you and to free your mind. Thank you and good evening. Peace. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate this. And it was nice talking with you. Thank you.